Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you really trust God? Trust Him with all things. Now, many people will say, I trust God after I die with my eternity, where I'm going to be forever and ever. Yes, I give God that aspect of my future. But what about now? Many people are uncomfortable letting God control their lives. They do not submit. They're not interested in obeying. They want to be in control until they die. And then they're willing to hand over everything to God. Now, of course, that is so foolish. God is sovereign. He is supreme. And therefore, a wise one will want God ruling, controlling every aspect of our life, not just after we die. And a great example of someone who truly trusted in God was King David. Now, think of King David for a moment before he was in that position. We need to remember that he was the eighth son of a man by the name of Yeshai or Jesse in English. And I'm sure you'll recall that when Samuel the prophet came to to Bethlehem, to the house of Yeshai to anoint the next king of Israel, remember the seven brothers were there, but David was not. And no one thought, you know what? We should go get young David because he may be the choice. No one considered David God's choice to be king. But God did. And eventually, after the first seven proved not to be God's choice, Samuel said, this is not the Lord's anointed. Finally, they went and got King David. And at this time, David was certainly not king. He was simply a shepherd boy, working out in the fields, being faithful to his flock and faithful to his father. He had a strong faith in God, and therefore God called him. And when David submitted to that call, God used him mightily, but don't think it was always easy for David. We know that David, he was key in Shaul's administration. Saul, the king, was not faithful. God was was not blessing him. And we see that that Saul was about to lose the, the nation to the hands of the Philistines. And none of the the soldiers of Israel would go out and do battle with Goliath. But David he came just to bring food and to see the situation and bring back a report to his father. And when he heard Goliath taunting the children of Israel, David in an instant said, I'll go and fight him. And he brought about victory for the king, Saul. But nevertheless, Saul later on, insecure, wanting to hold on to his position, not trusting God, God ripped that kingdom away from him, and as he was doing so, Saul wanted to kill David. So much so that this psalm that we're going to study, Psalm 59, is an example of how David felt in the midst of the king hunting him down. And just think of this. The king, Shaul, had all of the resources. The army was on his side, everything was in favor of Shaul. But David, this young man, he trusted in God, and what happened? God delivered him. We, when we trust in God, believe what he has said. We're going to find God's faithfulness 
being realized in our experiences so take out your bible and look there with me the book of psalms and psalm 59 now notice how this begins again we have an inscription which says to the chief musician or to the orchestra leader and it says that once again this is a psalm where it's entitled in the inscription al tashkit which means do not destroy and the context is david is saying pleading with god god don't let me be destroyed david felt very vulnerable at this time we see again that david is indeed the author it says of david by david and then once again this is the third time we've seen that it's a nichtam, which is a psalm that contains wisdom instruction knowledge that's more price precious than the the best gold and now we're given the context keep reading where it says when saul sent meaning he sent soldiers in order that they should guard or watch the house and the scholar tells us that this is when saul sent his servants military leaders in order to watch to guard the house of david in order that they could could capture david and what does it say at the end in order to put him to death so david was not experiencing paranoia he had an enemy a strong enemy the king of israel who wanted to put him to death and was was expending great resources in order to bring this about i just think for a moment you a young man and the king the most powerful man in your nation is wanting you to die he's hunting you down and he puts the national military against you you are alone no one's on your side but god see david he trusted in god no matter what the circumstances were but david we're going to see in this psalm he's going to cry out to god in order that god would assist him it doesn't say that david didn't fear he didn't fear from from the enemy he feared god this enemy made him feel vulnerable but that vulnerability caused him to trust and speak out cry out to god let's begin the first verse in your bible verse 2 in the hebrew text he says simply deliver me now this is a word for being rescued being delivered and he says rescue me from my enemies my god and he uses the term for for god that relates to god as a righteous as a perfect judge and here's what david is saying david has confidence because he knows and we're going to see this this is not always the case david there are times when david was not faithful david sinned he transgressed and found himself as the consequence of that disobedience in a very difficult circumstance david even though that he was disobedient at times he still trusted in god repented confessed his sin and believed that god would renew this covenantal agreement and act in his behalf well this is a very different psalm because david and we'll see this in a moment david is solely innocent he is not sin he has not committed some iniquity some transgression he is innocent but nevertheless the enemy wants to put him to death so he says here deliver me or rescue me from my enemies my god from the ones who stand up against me he says and then we have a word that's going to repeat several times it's the word misgav now this word is a word the word segev is a word that speaks of something that is is very high up and you can think of it as the top of a tree and the the message is that it's out of reach so when we use this word misgav we're talking about something that's out of reach 
So the image here that the word conveys is God speaking or taking David and placing David out of reach of his enemy. That is making David to be in a refuge, a place of safety. And what David is saying is, you be that refuge, you be that deliverer, that defender for me against the ones who rise up against me. Next verse, it begins with that same word of delivering, rescuing. So he says, Hatsileni, deliver me, rescue me from. And notice what his enemies are. They are not righteous men. They are not God-fearing individuals. They are those who are workers of, of wickedness. So David is an advantage. And think about this for a moment, that when you have an enemy, is that enemy also an enemy of God? That's very important, that you are on the side of God. These ones that are hunting David down, that are being loyal to Shoal, they're not righteous, God-fearing individuals. They are individuals that are workers of wickedness. And then it says, the second part of our verse, where it says, from men, damim. Damim, the word dam, is blood. This is blood in the plural. It relates to men who are, are shedders of blood. And the implication here with this word is that killing someone if it serves their purpose, if it's going to be something that, that someone's going to reward them, whether it's right or wrong, they don't care. They are quick to shed innocent blood. And more than that, there are individuals that have no fear of God, and therefore David, he cries out at the end of this verse, Hoshiani, which means save me. So we've seen the word Hatsileni, deliver me, rescue me, and this word here, hoshiani, which means save me from the general word for salvation. Verse 4 in Hebrew, verse 3 in your Bibles. For behold, they lay in wait. Now this word for laying in wait, when it's a noun, we would translate it as an ambush. So these individuals are waiting, they're hiding and they're going to pounce. They're wanting to ambush David. And notice what he says. He says, these that are waiting in ambush for my soul. This is another example that this is a, a fight that's going to end with death. That's what their objective is. And then he says, they gather together, they assemble, we might say, against me. And who is this? Well, we have a word here that comes from a word which means strong, these strong ones, these powerful ones. And notice it's in the plural. David is alone, but God is with David. And David is trusting in this covenantal agreement that he has with God, that David is wanting to serve God. And when we are wanting to serve God, that is, and hear this carefully, that is one of our best defenses against the enemy when we are committed to serving God. Because when we are obedient to God's will, that is going to bring God's protection, his defense into our life. So David is saying, you know, deliver me, save me from those who are in ambush against my soul, those who have gathered against me these strong ones. And then he says at the end of this verse, lo pishi ve lo chata'i Hashem, which means there is no transgression with me. There is no sin of mine. David is not in, in being pursued by the enemies because of some punishment, some discipline that God is allowing or God has placed upon him. David is saying, I am a victim in this. I am innocent. There is no transgression or sin that I've committed that, that would justify these individuals behaving in this way. He's saying here, they are not acting in a just manner. Verse 5 in Hebrew, verse 4 in others. He says, without iniquity, 
they run after, so they're running after David, and they want to establish, they want to establish themselves in the position. They're running and they're wanting to position themselves where they can fulfill their objective, and that is to put David to death. So what does he do? David realizes something. He is not able to, to contend against them, one against many. He's outnumbered. He doesn't have the resources in the physical sense. So David says, look at the end of this verse. He says, Urah, the Grati. He says, God, that's who he's addressing, rise up and meet me. Come to where I am. You be present with me. He's inviting, and this is a great principle, because David is petitioning God. He's inviting him to be in his situation, to come and to, to be present in this, this dangerous location that David has found himself in. And he simply says to God, and look. Now, he's not telling God what to do. He's saying, God, God, just behold my situation. He wants to bring before God all the facts of his circumstances, lay them out because he knows God is a just God. God is going to act and move in regard to his will and to those who are committed to the will of God. God is David's only hope if he's going to be brought through this, this time of his life in order to, to do more for God. Next verse, verse 6 in Hebrew, 5 and others. And you, O Lord God, the host of the God of Israel. So we see here that David is using terms that speaks about his confidence in God, that God is that, that uh, one who has the heavenly host as his disposal. And he says here, basically another word, he mentioned wake up a little bit long ago. This is another synonym for that. Wake up and visit all. And he uses the term hagoyim, the Gentiles. Now, what does he mean? This is a good example of frequently this term goy this is in the plural goyim there's the definite article hagoyim the the nations or the gentiles but this is not how david's meaning it because at this time it is not that there are nations or gentiles pursuing him what's he referring to this term goy can have as an understanding one of its its frequent definitions is simply one who has no covenantal responsibility, no covenant uh, relationship with God. David does. Those who are pursuing him, they are not operating, living. They have no sensitivity to the covenant of God in their life because they're not acknowledging it. So when David says here, look again, and he says, rise up, and the word here is lifkod, which uh, sometimes it's a word to visit, but in this context, it's to visit upon them, these who have no covenant connection with you, God, visit upon them punishment. So he's saying, God, you rise up in order that you render your punishment. Why? Well, remember the context. David says, I have not transgressed. I have not sinned. There's no iniquity with me that, that is the cause of this. This is Saul's wickedness. Saul's desire to hold on in rebelliousness to him being the king after God has already said that prophecy has gone forth, that he's ripping the kingdom away from Shaul. So David is saying here, rise up and, and visit your punishment upon these that have no covenant with you. He says, don't be gracious to any of the ones who are, are treasonous. Now it's a word which means just that. Those who practice treason, and they practice their treason by doing wickedness, that is this. He's saying, God, if you look at these individuals, you will find, as he said earlier, they are, are workers of iniquity, of wickedness. There's nothing about them that's sensitive to your covenant truth, to your your purposes your will they are utterly rebellious and 
the description of their life, and he uses this word twice, the word Hebrew word avin, which is, is blatant wickedness. It is a wickedness that, that rejoices in wickedness. There is absolutely no hesitancy among them in, in regard to the evil that they do publicly. There's no shame in their life. They rejoice in wickedness. And therefore, David is saying, don't be, gra- don't be gracious to these who are treasonous men of wickedness, Selah. He says, keep on, next verse. They return in the evening, that means in darkness. They make noise as a dog. This may be they growl. They are going around like dogs. And it says they go around the city. So they are no good. They come out at night and they go about like dogs and realize that biblically, when we talk about dogs, dogs would go around in a pack. In fact, and there's some places to this world, in this world today, the dogs do this. We were a couple years ago in, in Bucharest, and at that time, there had been a few people that had been attacked, I think one killed by a pack of dogs in the city. So it was common much longer ago in the past for dogs not to be some domesticated kind animals, but to be those who were were going around in the city and they amounted to a legitimate threat, something that was was clearly dangerous. And this is how David is, is likening these individuals that are hunting him. They come out in the evening, they make all types of nor or an uproar as the dogs would do, and they would go throughout the city. And it says, next verse, verse 8 in Hebrews 7 and others, Behold, they express with their mouth. So they, they make noise, and the, the implication is that which is threatening, that which is intimidating, and they have their swords, and this is poetic language, it's symbolic, the swords are in their lips. So they express things that, that are not kind, and their words kind of are intimidating, threatening like a sword. And then it says, Ki me shomea, for who listens? Now, this is a statement of faith when he says, for who hears? This is the word shomea from the Hebrew word, you know the term shema, hear. But as I've said numerous times, this word for hearing is to hear. And with what you hear, there is an expected, a desires, a proper response. So David is saying, for who is it that hears this? They're making these noise. They're threatening, going about, causing an uproar in the city. Who is it that hears this? What should be our response to this? And then he's going to tell us, look now at at the next verse. He has just said, they go about in the city making noise. They speak with their mouth. Their their, uh, lips are like swords. Who's going to respond to this? And he says, verse 9, and you, O Lord, based upon them and what they're doing, you, O Lord, will laugh at them, meaning God does not take them, they're no match for him. He does not take them seriously. It says that you mock all, and your Bible might say nations, but again, all those who are without a covenant. And the implication here is that these are individuals that have rejected God's covenant. Now remember the context. Who is their leader? King Saul. And Shaul, He's not thinking spiritually. He's not thinking obedience to to God's will. God has already rejected him. But nevertheless, Saul is pursuing who is truly the Lord's anointed. And Saul can plot and plan. He can get the army on his side together, hunting David down. Saul has his objectives and God laughs at them. God scoffs at them because they're not going to be successful. God's not going to allow it. And it says God is going to mock all those, mock all those who who are without a covenant. Verse 10, his strength, and many commentators speak about Saul 
as the, the subject here, Saul's strength. It says, unto you I will keep. Now, it's not clear, but this is what one thing that we can see. Whether it's Saul's power, David says, God, I'm going to keep you. I, and how I would understand this, is this way. Saul has his power, his means, but David's saying, unto you, in regard to you, I'm going to keep meaning this. Left to myself, whether I could, could have all the resources of Saul or being alone, but trust in you, I'm going to keep you, O oh God. I'm going to keep, keep you on my side, remaining faithful to that covenant rather than, than giving any type of priority to his power. For God, and this is why he does that, this is why he's not a fleshly, a carnal individual, why he's spiritual and he trusts in the word of God. He says, for God is my, my refuge. And what he's speaking, that same word, misgav, is God that's going to keep me out of, of harm's way. Now, here's what we see. It's just mentioned in the verse before this. We've mentioned about how God laughs. This is a word of scorning. And also, we see the word here for mocking. How does he do that? Well, I believe the context and other commentators would support this. That here's Saul. He's just wanting to kill one man. This man is has been made an outcast by Saul. He is, is someone that everyone wants to stay away from. Why? Because everyone know he's a, a marked man and anyone who assists him, Saul's going to punish, put to death even. We've seen an example of that with the priest at, at one location. He killed them all because they helped David. So David is alone. And what is God doing? God is delivering David just, and this is over a period of not just a few days or weeks or a month, but a few years. He just keeps David just outside the reach. Saul so close in accomplishing his objective, but at the end, he's not able to carry out. David is able to slip away. David is, is uh, delivered. And this is what it means here about God laughing at Saul and mocking him and those who are with Saul. So David says, I'm going to keep God on my side. I'm not going to forsake that covenant for God is my, my refuge. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 11. The God of my grace, and that's exactly what this word is, the word chasdi, chesed, this word for, for God's grace. Remember, grace relates to salvation, but grace also relates to the will of God being fulfilled in someone's life. God gives grace so that we can obey him. And, and we see here, David is saying, my God is the God of, of grace. My God is gracious to me. And he is going to, notice what it says, yikadmeni, which means he is going to, we could translate, come before me. He's going to be my defense. He's going to come before me. Or he is going to promote me, meaning he's going to move me forward. Saul, his objective is to bring me to an end, to stop me in my tracks so that I can't go forward. God is going to move me forward in his plan. So ask yourself a question. Do you have a desire to move forward in God's plan. If you do and you're committed to that, that is inviting God's protection, his deliverance, his help into your life. But if you're not committed to the things of God, don't expect God to, to work mightily in order to, to save you from the enemies. So he says, the God of my grace, he will, will promote me, he will position me, or he will come before me god look at me when my enemies come and some would say god uh uh you in regard to my enemies you you uh look at me you remember your purposes in my life you in light of my enemies you need to to move verse 12 in hebrew verse 11 in other languages 
do not, and this is a verse that uh, at first glance is kind of hard to, to understand. He says, do not kill them lest they, they forget my people. And what is this talking about? Sometimes death is too good for someone. Just them dying, the problem is this. You know, if the, the one generation dies out, the generation after that, you know, the young people, they may not remember, they may not have the perspective for realizing what God did in slaying those individuals. So David is saying, you know, don't just put them to death. Don't kill them. Let them live in defeat. Let them experience your anger in order that they won't forget the message is this. If that one generation would just die, perhaps that next generation, those kids, when they get older, they won't remember anything of, of what God did in, in delivering David and the people of God. So he says, you know, don't kill them all at once. Let them, then let them live and survive as a testimony of being defeated by the Lord. So he says, don't, don't kill them all at once, lest they forget my people. And then he says, in your power, scatter them. And he says, and bring them down. Who's this? My defense, my Lord. Now, notice these two things, and it stands out. These two words are set apart in the Hebrew text. And what is the purpose of this? To emphasize and show a relationship. So we've been going through this, and sometimes words, there's spaces, large spaces, and that's what we have here. After the term for, for bring them down, we have a long space where it says, my shield, my protector, my Lord. Now, why do we have these two words together? My shield, this is term magen. We know the term magen David, the shield of David, and my Lord. The message is this. It is only when I acknowledge God as Lord. And this is the term, when we look at it, it comes from, derived from the word Adon, which is master in, in Hebrew. So we can expect God to be that deliverer, that shield, that protector, that defense for us when we are living and by our life's decisions, our behavior, we are acknowledging his lordship in our life. Verse 13. The sin of their mouth, the word of their lips because of what they say he says let them be captured in their pride their words express document their 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 pride and he says let them be captured in their pride and from cursing and falsehood and this word for falsehood is really a word of denying the, the truth of God. So they're cursing. They're not interested in blessing. And they don't uh, uh, embrace God's truth. They deny his truth. And what happens? Well, keep reading. It says here, this is how they speak. So they speak from cursing and from, from falsehood, from denying your word. Because of that, next verse, verse 14 in Hebrew, 13 in other languages, he talks about them being, being uh, best way to put it, all over. They come to an end. They are finished. And let them be finished or consumed in, in wrath. Let them be consumed, destroyed, is another way that we could put it, that they are no longer. For they know that, that they might know that God rules in Jacob. And here Jacob is being used for Israel, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So it's not that Saul, he may be king, but Saul is not the king of kings, the Lord of lords in the nation of Israel. It's God. 
And therefore, King David says simply, let them know that God rules in, in Jacob to the ends of the earth, Selah. Now, this term Selah is a term of, of emphasis. It's a term that, that is at the end of a thought, and it's really praising God or, or acknowledging God in a way that, that emphasizes his goodness, his glory, his holiness, and, and just all the good attributes that God, God displays. Verse 17. Verse 16, excuse me. It says, verse 15, actually, verse 15, 14 in your Bible. They go around, he said this earlier, they go around at evening and they make noise as a dog. They go around throughout the city. So that same verse that we saw earlier, and we go back, for example, to verse Verse 7 in the Hebrew, 6 in English, we see that same verse being repeated. Once more, he says, they, they return, would be a better way to translate this, they return in the evening and they make noise as a dog and they go around the city. They are those that move, and this is a word for, the image here, remember, is those dogs. They move back and forth. They go about in order for food. Now, there's a really a play on word because this word for, for food, it's the basic word for eating, but it can also be used in a sense of consuming. So they're going throughout the city, making an uproar, and they're just devouring things. They're not thinking about the well-being of anyone. They're out to get what they want and, and leave destruction in their past that's what it's saying here and if they're not satisfied they complain meaning it's all about their satisfaction they give no thought and this is really an anti-torah mindset because the torah what's all the torah in one sentence love your neighbor as yourself they're not giving any thought to others if they don't get what they want they complain now we're ready for verse, verse 17 in Hebrew, 16 in other languages. This is what David says. David is not going to focus in on them. See, this is a mistake that oftentimes people make. That is, we have an enemy, those who are against us, and not just that they may not like us, they may not be helping us, they may be working against us. These are wanting to put David to death. Realize a big difference. And in the midst of this, and they're all out for themselves. David says, in the midst of this, what am I going to do? He says that he is going to, he says, but in contrast to that, I will sing of your power. God's power is greater than the evilness of the enemy. He says, I will shout. And this is usually a shout of great emotion with joy. I will shout in the morning your grace now learn just this wonderful thing what david is saying david is in the midst of hostility people are angry with him they are pursuing him they have a a stakeout at his home for when he might come home that they can grab him and kill him david is in a most vulnerable position but notice the principle that he says he says god i'm going to worship you now he puts it this way and I will sing concerning your power. I will shout with joy in the morning your grace. Now, we see two things here. We see a connection between the power of God and the grace of God. So the message is simple. The principle is this. If we want the power of God, we get it through his grace. And we have access to his grace in a spirit of worship. Worship brings about a change whereby through worship, we are given greater access to the provision of God, especially his provision of grace. Then he says, second part of the verse, for you have been, and this is the third or fourth time we've seen this word, misgav, for you have been 
a, a place of refuge, a place of defense, that same word which means to take someone and put them out of reach, to put them up high where the enemy cannot harm them. So he says, for you have been a refuge unto me. And manos, manos is a word for, for fleeing away. It's a word of, of deliverance. And here's the idea. You might be under attack. I mentioned about wild dogs a little while ago. So here's this dog pursuing you, maybe a pack of them. And what do you do? You're looking for a place to run to, to run away and that it will lead to safety. That's what a manos is. It's a place that you can depart, that you can flee to, and you're fleeing into safety. So David is saying, God, you have been a deliverer unto me. You place me in a place of safety. You're that one that helps me flee, again, flee to safety in the day that there's trouble unto me. Last verse, verse 18 in Hebrew, 17 in others. My power, my strength, unto you I will praise. Which means this, you are God, are my strength, you are my power, therefore unto you I will sing. And this idea of singing is a singing of praising God. It's a word of worship. Then he says, another time, for God speaks of him being my refuge, my place of safety. And then he says, Elohe Christi, the God of my grace. Now, the two things I want to emphasize <laughs> before we close, excuse me, is this. David is saying, God, I need a place of safety. I need you to move and put me out of the reach of the enemies. David has used that language many, many times. And what he's saying here is the greatest resource for that is God's grace. God's grace saves, <laughs> saves from the consequences of our sins eternally, from God's judgment, his consuming judgment. God's grace is the only uh, uh, solution to that. Secondly, we see that God's grace moves in our life in order to position us whereby God's work and will can be done in and through our life. And when we're in that place doing God's will, that is the safest place that we can be. So God is indeed that place of safety, that refuge for us in times of trouble. This psalm shows us that we can pray effectively, saying, God, yes, there's an enemy out there, but I trust in you. I depend upon you. And I'm not going to allow the enemy, all their attacks, all their threats, I'm not going to let the enemy stop me from worshiping you nor stop me from serving you and realize and i'll close with this there's a great correlation a very close relationship between worshiping god and serving god it's only when we worship god effectively that we'll be effective in serving god this is what david is revealing in this psalm psalm 59 in this study this evening. Well, I'll close now. May God bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>